Today, uh, we're going to start talking about the, the challenges to Soviet control over their, their Eastern uh, European hemisphere. We want to remember that after World War II, and you guys can see it on the map here, after World War II, those nations that were liberated by the Soviets from the Nazi control would all fall within the Soviet sphere of influence. So Poland and what becomes East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, they all fall within the Soviet sphere. What does this mean? It means each of them are going to have one-party communist states. They're all going to be dependent on the Soviet Union, to some degree economically and militarily. The Soviet Union will help orchestrate throughout all of them the nationalization of industry. When, when private companies or private industries are taken over by the state, the Soviet Union will help orchestrate the collectivization of agriculture of these nations. So when, whenever we hear of a country becoming communist, uh, we want to think of those two words, the nationalization of industry, the collectivization of agriculture. Is everybody cool and comfortable with what those two words mean? Awesome. The integration of the economies of these Eastern European nations as well with the Soviet Union. Especially once the, uh, the organization called Comic-Con, the, the Committee for Mutual Economic Assistance, is established to link the economies of the Soviet Union with those of Eastern Europe. And then the Soviet Union will also move to support Soviet-style censorship through Eastern European nations. So the states will be controlling the presses, for example. Suppression of religious freedom, because communist states are a-religious states, or without religion. And they will also have Soviet troops present throughout Eastern Europe. So that's the situation after World War II. Now, about some attempts over the next few decades to resist that control by the Soviet Union. And we start with Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia is a little bit of a special case. Watch out, Kevin, he's keeping his eye on you there. Uh, Yugoslavia is a little bit of a special case here. Because Yugoslavia, unlike those other Eastern European nations, was never liberated during World War II by these Soviets. The Soviet Red Army didn't have to go into Yugoslavia to drive the Nazis out. Yugoslavian partisans, led by Joseph Broz Tito, liberated their own nation. And Tito was, before the war, during the war, and after the war, already a communist. Please don't think that communism only comes from the Soviet Union, right? Tito was a communist before World War II, during World War II, and obviously afterwards. So as the liberation of Yugoslavia is not tied to the Soviet Union, he doesn't have to deal with Red Army troops in Yugoslavia. Tito is free to go his own way in the post-war world. He can establish a communist government in Yugoslavia, but that doesn't mean he has to be closed off to the United States. So Yugoslavia and Joseph Broz Tito would keep economic relationships open between the United States and, and Yugoslavia. And this will obviously anger the Soviet Union, anger Joseph Stalin. Yugoslavia even accepted some Marshall Plan aid. Really the only, uh, so, the only communist nation to do so. By 1948, Yugoslavia and Joseph Stalin, the Soviet Union, will officially split. And they will cease having any economic or diplomatic relationship with each other. Tito is a threat to Stalin because Tito is not following Stalin's orders. 1948, Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union 
will officially split. Now, interestingly enough, this is only a couple years before NSC 68 says what? All communism is linked to Moscow. We, of course, know that that's not the case, at least in terms of Yugoslavia. But what we didn't believe at the time, and we were right, that Yugoslavia was not trying to spread communism elsewhere, whereas the Soviet Union was. The Soviet Union was actively supporting communist movements in other, in other nations, while Yugoslavia was not doing Stalin hated this guy so much, he would even lead what he would call purges against Titoists, those that would support those communists of Eastern Europe that supported Tito's policies rather than Stalin's. So Stalin would move to get rid of Titoists, whether they be in East Germany or Poland or anywhere else. So we have in Yugoslavia one example very early on that it is somewhat possible, at least, to go counter to the Soviet Union. So you've got this, this oddball nation in Eastern Europe that is not falling under the Soviet sphere. And maybe that gives a little bit of an example to others in Eastern Europe that they could go their own way as well. Yes? Really? Interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, all right, the next uh, sign of tension. East Germany in 1953. In 1953, workers in East Germany will begin a protest that evolves into a, revo a revolt against the government over the production targets that they were being forced to meet, which ultimately were dictated by the East German government and the Soviet Union. Now remember, workers in East Germany are a little bit unique in a, in a communist Soviet system. Because what were workers in East Germany prior to 1945? Many of them were agricultural workers, but there were still factories and, and such in, uh, in East Germany. But in, prior to 1945, were they in a communist system? No. No, they... they had free labor in, in Germany prior to 1945. And so they could have worked, yes sir? Well, neither were Romanian or Slovakian. Sure, sure, sure. I'm, I'm just saying that these guys are, are probably, they, they were part of a German economy that was more developed and advanced than okay. any of the other Eastern European economies. And they had, they had no concept of this Soviet style economic uh, state. So in June of 1953, protests turn into revolts in East Germany. And the Soviet Union will respond to them by rolling tanks in to suppress, to violently suppress these protests. And they do that. They quickly suppress the protests. And so here we have in East Germany in 1953 an example of how the Soviet Union will deal with any kind of threat to Soviet control over their satellite states. In 1955, the Soviet Union gets a new leader. In early 1956, Nikita Khrushchev will give what's known as that secret speech. We've talked about this before. Where he tries to end the cult of personality that Joseph Stalin had built over the previous three decades. While Khrushchev's speech is going to strengthen his position in the Soviet Union, it's going to weaken Soviet authority outside. We talked about how Mao reacted to the secret speech, thinking Khrushchev was weak. We will also see a reaction coming from Eastern Europe. Khrushchev will also move to restore relations with Tito. And so the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia will start to talk again. Well, other Eastern Bloc nations, nations in the Soviet sphere in Eastern Europe, other Eastern Bloc nations are going to see Khrushchev now as an opportunity that this new Soviet Union is different from the old Stalinist regime. 
and maybe there's a way for those Eastern European nations to go their own way, just like Tito had gone his own way. Trick, would you like to share a song with everybody? No. She's singing a little Fleetwood Mac up here, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, in June of 1956, Polish workers, much like German workers had done back in 1953, they will start a, a protest movement that results in a, a largely a compromise between Poland and the Soviet Union. Yes, ma'am. 56, right after the secret speech. To allow some more concessions to Polish workers. But in 1956 in Hungary, things go much further. In 1956, Hungary replaces their leader, who was a hardline Stalinist, with a more moderate communist leader. And Hungary had hopes of becoming a neutral state, not being a part of this Soviet sphere anymore. This, yes ma'am? Um, what do you mean by a moderate communist state? Like, like not a hardline Stalinist, um, not as rigid as Joseph Stalin was. In response to these protests that started to swell in Hungary, yes, ma'am? Aligned with the Soviet Union purely anymore. Like they could make alliances with the East and West or make agreements with the East and West. Because remember, if you were part of the Eastern Bloc, you were frozen out of what was going on in Western Europe, right? You couldn't accept any of the Marshall Plan money that had previously been, been offered to Western Europe. You couldn't enter into trade negotiations and relationships with Western European states. You were, you were out. You could only have these relationships with Eastern Europe. And remember that the United States is trying to sell Western Europe and the capitalist-style democracies that are growing in Western Europe as the, the way everybody should be going. So, so Hungary, for example, in 56, wants a little bit of that. And the Soviet Union is going to squash these protests. In 1956, the Soviet Red Army will roll into Budapest, Hungary, the capital of the country. And after 20,000 Hungarians are killed in this action. Now, wrap your head around that, guys. 20,000 Hungarians are going to be killed in the Soviet Union bringing Hungary back within the Soviet sphere. You guys uh, might be familiar with the story in, uh, during the Vietnam War where there was a protest at Kent State University in Ohio. Are you familiar with this at all? Um, and it was, a, it was an anti-war protest. And the governor of Ohio had called in the National Guard to keep the peace, supposedly, at this protest. And then things went haywire, and in the end, four protesters were shot and killed by the Ohio National Guard. And this became, uh, there was a huge public outcry out of, the, out of this. Uh, there, it, was a, it was a national disaster. Uh, when four, four college students were killed in Kent State, Ohio. In 1956, the Soviet Union brought in their military and 20,000 Hungarians were killed in order to keep Hungary firmly within the Soviet sphere, to squash any protests in Hungary. It's a very different reality in, in Eastern Europe than what we see in the West. So the results of these early protests being squashed by the Soviet Union is that the United States is staying out of, of the Eastern European issues. The United States was not going to enter into Hungary to protect them. Because what was our policy in the Cold War in the 1950s? Yeah. Contain it. Contain it. Don't let it spread. But we, we, this is not our issue to deal with. All right? But we have to make note that the Warsaw Pact, those nations within the Warsaw Pact, and that are in the Soviet sphere, are under a very different relationship than those NATO nations are with the United States. The United States never had to roll tanks into to London or into Paris. 
We never had to convince countries to join NATO. They wanted to. They didn't want to leave. They were able to stay, and we, and we were good with that, and they were good with that. Whereas the Soviet Union had to use its military to maintain its alliances. Kevin. But then also at the same time, we were occupied with the Celeste crisis mm -hmm. when our allies were invading Egypt, and that looked really bad for us. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Uh, and we'll talk more about the Suez. So the Soviets could say, oh, you're invading Egypt. We can invade Hungary. I, I don't know that we can. I don't know that the Soviets could or did say that uh, because even though they were our allies, the United States under Eisenhower, and we'll talk about the Suez crisis uh, within the, the next couple weeks, the United States under Eisenhower was, was furious that that Suez operation was launched without our knowing about it. Um, and that was a, a rare case in the early Cold War where both the United States and the Soviet Union were on the same page to get Egypt and, or to, pardon me, to get France and Britain out of, of Egypt and Israel out of Egypt. Sure, sure, I see that, I see that. All right, fast forward to the 1960s. Uh, we get a new leader in the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev, right? We've already talked about him. In 1968, frustration with the Czechoslovakian government leads to mass protests in, in the capital city of Prague. Brezhnev comes to power in 68, and this is happening in 68. In a protest movement that becomes known as the Prague Spring. You guys remember the Arab Spring that we lived through a couple years ago? Right? Well, the first spring, this began in Prague back in 1968. The citizens of Prague attempting to, uh, to get a less repressive Czechoslovakian government. And the new leader of Czechoslovakia in 1968, a guy named Alexander Dubček, I don't think you need to know his name, but just hear it, Dubček, D-U-B-C-E-K, promised reforms and liberalization for Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia would, be, uh, would get the Soviet response to this move to modernize. And that would be with the Soviet Red Army rolling into Prague to squash this protest movement. And a new hardline government was installed into Czechoslovakia. These actions in Czechoslovakia would lead Leonid Brezhnev to formulate what is known as the Brezhnev Doctrine. We've already talked about this. The Brezhnev Doctrine says that all communist parties of all communist nations are not just responsible for their own people, but for all communist nations. So the Soviet government has a responsibility not just to the Soviet Union citizens, but also to the communist citizens of Czechoslovakia or Poland or Hungary or anywhere else. And so it is under the auspices of the Brezhnev Doctrine that the Soviet Union will do things like this. If communism is threatened, if the communist regime is threatened, the Soviet Union will respond with force. This is not all that different from the Truman Doctrine of the United States, where non-communist nations, if they were being threatened, that the United States would support them militarily. In 1980, in 1980, we go to Poland now. Poor economic conditions and poor worker conditions in Poland would lead to a growing unionist movement that starts in the city of Gdansk. I'm going to write that down for you. I might write that down if I get my marker. I lost my marker. Gdansk, G-D-A-N-S-K. This is in northern Poland. Shipyard workers in Gdansk, in Poland, led by a guy named Lech Wałęsa, and you see him right here. 
Lech Valencia, leads the shipyard workers, the dock workers in Gdansk, to create an independent trade union known as Solidarity. They call their union Solidarity. Oh, I, I didn't see that, but uh, we'll look it up in a little bit, yeah. So Lech Valencia leads a, a new trade union in Gdansk. Now, this is kind of weird to think like this, because we associate trade unions in the United States with leftists, right? It's like the political left that, is a, that are strong supporters of unions and unionized workers, right? Uh, like you'll hear... Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton talking much more about supporting workers' rights and unions rather than hearing any of that from the Republican side of the argument. So you wouldn't think that a leftist government, a leftist communist government would have a problem with trade unions. But the problem is trade unions, unions, protest the conditions of workers, or they, they work to get better conditions for labor, right? In the United States, in a, in a capitalist system, a labor union is making arguments or, or they're, they're supporting the workers to gain better conditions from the owners of those industries, right? Well, who owns the industries in a communist state? The state does, the government. So in a communist government, unions are actually like protesting the conditions that the government is bringing on them. So I, I think sometimes it's a little counterintuitive because we think of unions as like more left-wing kind of things in, our, in the United States. But in communist governments, in very left-wing states, they don't want unions either because it's the unions that are protesting the actions of the government who controls those states. Well, when Lech Walesa organizes the Solidarity Union in Poland and the Polish dock workers go on strike, because that's the, the one true power of a labor union, is the power to strike, to not work, right? This is a major threat seen by the Soviet Union. If workers in Poland are allowed to do this, what are workers in every other city under communism going to do? They're going to strike. If, if, if these workers go on strike and they actually get better conditions, every other worker in every other industry in every other communist nation are going to see that the same thing can be true for them. This is seen as a threat by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union threatens to go into Poland to squash this, but the Polish government agrees to handle it on its own. They, they will stop this on their own so that the Soviets never have to come in. Poland will declare martial law, which means the military is going to take over the, uh, the policing of the nation. And the Solidarity Union is forbidden in Poland. So again, another example of the threat of the Soviet Union coming in gets Eastern European nations to, uh, to back down. Now, outside of Eastern Europe, We'll talk about the 1979 invasion of Afghanistan. This is the Brezhnev Doctrine in action. A very brief background. In Afghanistan in 1978, there was a coup, an overthrowing of the local government. And a pro-Soviet government took power in Afghanistan in 1978. This pro-Soviet government in Afghanistan was repressive against the people of Afghanistan, particularly the very religious Muslims in Afghanistan. And so after the 1978 coup in Afghanistan, Muslim fighters that didn't support this new government started striking against the government of Afghanistan in a guerrilla campaign. In 1979, the Soviet Union will roll tanks into Afghanistan to support that government of Afghanistan against these fighters in Afghanistan 
who want to see that government fall. This story very closely parallels what the United States was doing in Vietnam. Remember, the United States went into South Vietnam to support the government of South Vietnam against people in South Vietnam that did not like the government of South Vietnam. Right? So the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan, or goes into Afghanistan in 1979. They will quickly support another coup in Afghanistan to overthrow that new government of Afghanistan to put an even more closer line to the Soviet government in, in charge. The results of this invasion of Afghanistan, it's the Brezhnev Doctrine in action. It's the, it's the Soviet Union using their military to support another pro-Soviet state. Is that President Jimmy Carter will issue what's known as the Carter Doctrine. Because Afghanistan is right next door to Iran, and Iran is right on the Persian Gulf. And there's a lot of oil in the Persian Gulf region. So that the United States will pledge U.S. support if the Soviet Union threatens the Persian Gulf region. The United States also moves to support those very Afghan fighters that are now fighting against the Soviet Union. We support them financially and militarily by sending aid into, indirectly supporting them, by sending aid into Pakistan to make its way into these fighters in Afghanistan. As kind of an unfortunate, we can't really predict the future very well, side story to this, one of the fighters, and there were thousands of Muslim fighters from around the Islamic world that went to Afghanistan to fight against the Soviet Union because they saw this as a, a fight not just between Afghanistan and the Soviets, but as a religious fight between believing Muslims and this atheistic state of the Soviet Union. So a, a call for religious war went out throughout the Islamic world, and many thousands of Muslims from around the world went to Afghanistan to fight. One of them was a guy named Osama bin Laden from Saudi Arabia. And so he, along with some compatriots of his, went to Afghanistan to fight. The United States indirectly supported those fighters. Now, there was never an instance where the United States met with Osama bin Laden and handed him anything or anything like that. But we were certainly supporting the same team, right? And uh, ultimately, Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen fighters in Afghanistan, they're victorious. The Soviet Union will go home eventually by 1988. They leave Afghanistan. As it was such an expensive fight that the new leader of the Soviet Union, a guy named Mikhail Gorbachev, did not see it as worth it anymore to stay in Afghanistan. But as a side note to this story, you get some of these fighters in Afghanistan who now feel that they have defeated the Soviet Union that they have defeated the most powerful military on the planet, and they saw the Soviet Union as a more dangerous military threat than the United States, because the Soviet Union, as we're seeing in, in the war against ISIS right now, the Soviet Union has far less uh, desire to avoid civilian casualties and, and things like this than the United States does. That someone like bin Laden, after the Soviet Union is defeated in Afghanistan, will then turn their attention to the United States. If they can defeat the Soviets in Afghanistan, they can defeat the United States elsewhere in the Middle East. It is also out of this, this rebel fight uh, in Afghanistan that the Taliban comes to power. The Taliban were part of these groups of Muslims that were fighting against the Soviet Union in the 1980s and the Taliban would ultimately take control of Afghanistan. We are very good at dealing with situations today. We are not very good at predicting how those situations will result in the future, right? You know, some would argue, would it have been better had the United States never supported it? We allowed the Soviet Union to, to win in Afghanistan. Would that have been better for everybody involved? Tough, tough call to me. But we'll never know. Yeah. Um, so 
there was a pro-Soviet government in Afghanistan in 1978. And there were a number of particularly devout Muslims in Afghanistan who saw the Soviet supported government as a threat to them. Remember, in, in the Soviet Union, in communist governments, religion is verboten, all right? These are atheistic states. So they saw the Soviets' involvement in Afghanistan as a threat to their ability to practice their faith as they see fit. So they began to join organizations that would fight against that government. And these would, we could call them guerrilla insurgents, whatever you want to call them, that they were fighting against the government of, of Afghanistan. Just like the Viet Cong was fighting against the government of South Vietnam. And ultimately, the Soviet Union invaded to support the friendly government in, in Afghanistan against these fighters. Good? Good. All right. Now talking about, ultimately, the end of the Cold War. This guy is of supreme importance, Mikhail Gorbachev. He will be the final premier of the Soviet Union. Comes to power in 1985. Gorbachev recognizes that the attempts by the Soviet Union to keep up with the United States militarily can never be successful. That the Soviet Union cannot possibly maintain military equality with the, with the United States. Especially in light of what Ronald Reagan has been doing. What was Ronald Reagan up to in his first few years in office? Okay, new weapon systems, new bombers, new submarines, new long-range missiles, and the Star Wars defense plan, the Strategic Defense Initiative. Gorbachev recognized that he can't keep up with the United States. So he's got to do something to start reducing the Soviet spending on the military. Gorbachev will also usher in two key areas of reform within the Soviet Union. First, perestroika. I'll spell it for you up here. Perestroika and glasnost. Perestroika refers to a restructuring of the Soviet economy, allowing some more limited free enterprise into the Soviet Union. Glasnost refers to openness within the Soviet society, that the Soviet government should be more open to the public and more open to public scrutiny and criticism. Like you guys know in the United States how we're allowed to kind of poke fun and, 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 and speak against our leaders. And we see if you watch Saturday Night Live or whatever, you, you see this often. This was not allowed in the Soviet Union because the government controlled all, all areas of the press. After Glasnost, there will be more ability for people in the Soviet Union to voice their concerns. Yeah. Perestroika is just a, a restructuring of the economy to allow for more free enterprise within the Soviet Union. I always uh, equate it to my kids. You guys remember when you were little kids and you read the book, uh, the, the, there was a series of books uh, about giving mice cookies and such. Yeah. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a glass of milk, and if you give him a glass of milk, he's going to need a napkin to wipe his face up, and then he wants to go to the, see a movie or something. I don't know, there's a few steps in between. But... If you give in a little bit, they're going to keep asking for more. Well, Gorbachev is hoping that he offers, if he offers some limited reform, because what's going on throughout the Soviet world and throughout the Soviet sphere? They're recognizing that the rest of the world is doing things very differently, that the Western world is doing things very differently. One side note that maybe doesn't often get as much credit as it deserves um, with regard to ending the Cold War is the advent of satellite television, cable television. And the, the birth of MTV, 
Now, you guys don't really know what MTV is. It actually stands for music television. But they, they don't play, I don't think there's any, I don't even know where MTV is anymore on, on TV, but uh, I don't, do they play any music on MTV anymore? No. Not really? Yeah, they, they, now I think they had to make a separate MTV to actually play music because the real MTV doesn't have music on anymore. Well, back in the 80s, uh, in the early 80s, when MTV was born, it was music television. It literally played videos all, all day and night long. Uh, and the Eastern Soviet world, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, they started to see some of these things. And some of these ideas started to enter into the Soviet sphere. And Soviet citizens clamored for more. And they wanted more of the openness that was available in the West. So Gorbachev is hoping by offering some limited reforms that he can still hold on to the country, hold on to power in the country. But ultimately, it's going to go further than he ever plans for. Gorbachev recognizes financially and technology-wise, he can't keep up with the American military development. Certainly not the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars. So it's easier for, for Gorbachev to negotiate with the United States rather than to attempt to keep up, because he can't keep up. And in 1985, right when Gorbachev was taking power of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union has one of the worst, or arguably the worst, nuclear disaster in uh, the history of nuclear power. And what is that called, Maggie? Chernobyl, very good. In 1985, there's a meltdown at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. This is in present day Ukraine. There's a meltdown at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. But because the Soviet government was very closed on getting information to the people, they tried to cover this up. Ultimately, this was a disaster. The radiation that escaped from Chernobyl, from the Chernobyl disaster, has made that region uninhabitable today. It's essentially been taken over by wilderness again. But this also convinces Gorbachev, if he needed any convincing, that the threat of nuclear war was very serious and that he wanted to do more to avoid possible nuclear confrontation with the United States. To do that, Gorbachev would reach out to the American president. And from 1985 to 1988, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev would meet four separate times. working to, to limit the threat of nuclear war, working on new arms reduction talks. So they would meet in a series of four summits. You guys need not memorize these summits. Just know they met four times from 1985 to 1988. By 1988, Ronald Reagan publicly proclaims that the Soviet Union is no longer the evil empire that he once said they were upon coming to power in 1981 Wait, it's 1985 to, to 88 yep also in 1988 the soviet union will withdraw from afghanistan so gorbachev is hugely instrumental in changing the tone of the cold war by being willing to work with the united states but reagan for his credit deserves uh, some praise as well. Remember, Ronald Reagan is one of the guys that we credited with ending the detente period. Reagan ended the detente period. And he ushered in this second Cold War where the United States would again escalate our military spending. But had Reagan not done that, had Reagan not done that, Maybe Gorbachev would have never seen it, it, it necessary to reduce his own spending. Reagan was also, despite his rhetoric, Reagan was also very willing to work with Gorbachev. 
And remember, to have these meetings, it takes two to agree. So Gorbachev was there, but Reagan had to be there as well. Yes, Kevin? When did Boris Yeltsin come to America? When did he come to America? Yeah, that know. was part of why he like, separated Russia from the Soviet Union. Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know. Um, we also have some other long-term factors that go beyond just the individuals of Gorbachev and Reagan coming, bringing an end to the Cold War. The Soviet Union could not keep up economically, not just under, under Gorbachev, but even before. The Soviet Union was spending a far greater percentage of their national income on their military than the United States was. The United States could more easily afford our military than the Soviet Union could afford theirs. And remember, every, because in a communist system, every additional dollar that the government is spending on military is one less dollar that can go towards consumer goods. And the Soviet Union, by the 70s and into the 80s, was dealing with bread lines and shortages that would never be seen in the United States. The Soviet Union was also dealing with other economic problems, like absenteeism, people literally just not showing up for work, and a rise in, in alcoholism rates, chronic alcoholism in the Soviet Union. Morale was low in the Soviet Union. You know, remember, guys, in a, in a Western-style system, you work and you work hard because you get an income, and there's hopes that the harder you work, the more you would be rewarded for that, that labor. In the Soviet Union, there was no such system like that. And so morale was extremely low, and alcoholism was on the rise. So industrial output would start falling. The actual stuff that the Soviet Union was producing would start to fall. And then we have a series of nationalist movements in Eastern Europe. By the late 1980s, Poland first in 1988, that, that union, that trade union called Solidarity, led by Lech Walesa, was made legal. And it actually became a political party in 1988. By 1989, there were free elections in Poland. And again, the Soviet Union, what would they have done in 1956 or in 1968 if something like this happened? They would have rolled their tanks in. But under Gorbachev, having just pulled his army out of Afghanistan, having nowhere near the economic resources to do something like this in Poland, Gorbachev lets it happen. The Soviet Union does not intervene. And in 1989, Lech Walesa's Solidarity Party defeats the Communist Party in Poland. Polish communism collapses. In Germany, in 1989, the economic disparity between East and West is as clear as it has ever been. East Germans are still attempting to escape into West Germany. They can't easily go through Berlin anymore. They're trying to do it through Austria. But East Germans are still trying to leave. Mikhail Gorbachev, just like he had done with Poland, makes it clear that he won't intervene in German politics. In November of 1989, thousands of protesters mass in Berlin. And on November 9, 1989, they storm the Berlin Wall. Whereas, literally days before, they would have been shot for going to the wall. On November 9th, it just organically happens. A protest movement swells, and from both sides of the wall, East Germans and West Germans, East Berliners and West Berliners, climb upon the wall, and they begin to bring the wall down on November 9th, 1989. 
In 1990, the following year, free elections are held in Germany. And East and West Germans both vote to support reunification of the state. In October of 1990, East and West Germany officially become one again. It's 1990? 1990. Okay. Yeah, the vote ultimately happens in 1990, and they become reunified in 1990. The Berlin Wall comes down first. That was back in November of 89. But that's like the first step to reunification. And again, the Soviet Union does nothing. In Hungary, in Hungary in 1990, the Communist Party, seeing the writing on the wall, seeing what's happening in other states, the Communist Party in Hungary offers its own reforms. And they will offer free elections of their own in 1990. And ultimately, the Communist Party in Hungary will fall. The same Hungary where in 1956, 20,000 Hungarians were killed fighting for the same thing. By 1990, they get it. In Czechoslovakia in 1990, the Communist government will fall in what is known as the Velvet Revolution. Because velvet is soft. It doesn't have to be a violent revolution. And a new leader, a new non-communist leader of Czechoslovakia rises to power. Again, the Soviet Union does not intervene. Romania is a little bit of a different case. Romania has a communist leader named Nikolai Ceausescu. You don't need to worry too much about his name. But I will attempt to spell it correctly for you because it is challenging to spell. Nicolae Ceausescu in Romania, communist dictator of Romania, despite the calls for reform from his people, Ceausescu remains uh, the communist leader in, in Romania, trying to hold on to power. Eventually, his own military turns on him and will overthrow and execute Nicolae Ceausescu in Romania. All of those Eastern European states that had once been under the Soviet thumb are now free. Yes, ma'am? I didn't hear that. What's that? I, I think that doesn't come until 1992, I believe. 1990, a little bit later. What we see in the Soviet, or what we see in Eastern Europe, will be echoed in the Soviet Union. Despite Gorbachev's reform efforts, Darsh, despite Gorbachev's reform efforts, the economy of the Soviet Union is slow to improve, and Gorbachev becomes more and more unpopular, unpopular with the people, unpopular with the Communist Party. And with all of those Eastern European nations, like Poland and Czechoslovakia and Romania and Hungary, or pardon me, not Romania, but Hungary, getting their independence from the Soviet Union, there began to be a call for independence from those Soviet republics, places like Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia and others that had called for their own independence. And in 1991, that begins to happen. First, with those what we know as the Baltic states. And remember, those Baltic states weren't originally Soviet. They were only taken over during World War II by the Soviet Union. In 1991, Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania proclaimed their independence from the Soviet Union. And then following their independence, other Soviet socialist republics like Ukraine and Moldova and, and others, begin to break from the Soviet Union. And on Christmas Day of 1991, December 25th, 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev resigns, and the Soviet Union officially comes to an end. So now what was once the Soviet Socialist Republics now become 16 independent nations. The impact of the fall of the Soviet Union puts communism around the world in crisis. 
Because who are the chief financiers of the communist parties of places like Cuba and North Korea? It was the Soviet Union. Vietnam as well. So now the communist nations around the world will be in crisis. Cuba, for example, we'll talk more about them in a couple days. Cuba's economy is going to crumble without Soviet aid. African nations that had relied on Soviet aid for the previous two decades will lose that lifeline. And we'll see more violence and civil war in Africa. But for the Cold War, it's over. And where there were once two superpowers in the world, now there will just be the United States again. Until China keeps growing. Questions, comments from anybody? <laughs>